The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, who is still enjoying lovely Berlin. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, uh, regular listeners of our show may be aware of our frustrations. I think it's more of a frustration for me, but I think you share my frustration about the fact that in Africa and other parts of the world, the levels of China literacy have not only not gone up in recent years and you know not improved very much, they've actually regressed quite a bit because China itself has changed so much, so fast, especially things that are going on right now, that there isn't the China literacy or the China capacity within many governments to help keep leaders informed about this. And this was brought up recently during Zambian President Haikinda Hishilema's tour of China. We talked about it on our Africa show a couple of weeks ago. And a tweet or a post, as they now say, on X came up from Dr. Li Hangwei, who is a longtime China-Africa scholar. She's been around. We've had her on our show before. She's now a researcher at the German Institute of Development and Sustainability. And she called out President Haikinda Hishilema on X. And let me just read you her tweet, and I'd like to get your reaction to it. She said, Dear Haikinda Hishilema, I've noticed a few factual errors in your posts. Deng Xiaoping wasn't a Chinese president. Zhao Luji is the chairman of the National People's Congress. It's Fujian, not Fuilan, <laughs> F-U-I-L-A-N, which, of course, is a place that does not exist. Ningda is a city, not a district. And then she concludes, strengthening your team's expertise on China might be beneficial. Now, Kobus, these errors that Hishilema made in his post, okay, not that serious. But I think what Hang Wei is getting at is very, very important, that it speaks to a broader problem of not having people around him who can either write his post for him or educate him on some of these, these critical issues, especially while he's in China. We said the same thing about Congolese President Felix Chesikedi, who went to China and didn't even bring his own interpreters with him relied on Chinese interpreters. That is, again, an amateur move in diplomacy because you always want to know what the other guy's saying. And so it speaks to this lack of seriousness that a lot of leaders in Africa, and we've had some conversations with folks in other parts of the world as well, who don't seem to be applying to keep up with the changes in China. And to me, as Hang Wei is pointing out, I think it's a serious problem. Yeah, I also think so. I mean, particularly now when China is playing such a pivotal part in Africa and when African leaders are facing such uphill struggles in other parts of the world, particularly around, for example, climate funding, if you don't take yourself seriously, then no one else takes you seriously. And that is starting to feel a little bit like something that's kind of creeping in there. And we've heard it also from Kenyan President William Ruto, who was talking about China funding an extension of the railway. And that speaks to the fact that the Kenyan president himself isn't aware that China isn't doing this anymore. The new loan data came out last week from Boston University that showed this massive drop-off in lending to Africa. And I was so surprised, and I don't know if you were surprised, I thought this topic was going to get a lot of attention given how obsessed everybody in Africa and the West has been over the past 15 years about Chinese lending in Africa. Here we have a definitive report okay, in many ways, a benchmark report that shows the lowest lending in 20 years. And honestly, it was met with a giant yawn. Nobody really paid attention to it. I didn't understand that. I was expecting more discussion about these loans issues. Were you? Um, yeah, I, I was. But I also think that in a lot of ways, how can I say, like something not happening, lending not happening is, you know, kind of, there's just, there's something in, in reporting that kind of, 
makes that inherently harder to get excited about, I think. But then I think that the main reason, actually, is that among Western commentators and among African commentators, big loans were inherently just bigger news than no big loans, you know? Even though for us, and of course, even though realistically... The two are linked, and the trend is incredibly important. The trend is, is probably more important than, than some of the big loans that, that happened before. But, you know, kind of there, there's something, I think, in the in the kind of calculus of, of reporting, and particularly the, also the political calculus happening in both in Africa and in the West, where they just don't want to hear about no big loans from China. The only thing that's interesting for them is big loans from China. Well, the reason why this is so important right now is because if you don't understand what's happening in China today, then if you are government X, Y, or Z and you approach the Chinese and you're not bringing in the right proposals, you're not bringing in the right ideas, you're not meeting them on their terms. And right now, the magic words in the Chinese development finance sector is small is beautiful. Again, understanding this concept, I won't go into it now because we've talked about it extensively on the site and in previous episodes. If this is a topic you're interested in, just search on the site for small is beautiful and you'll start to see a lot of research that's come up about it. But this is the new trend in Chinese development finance. And this new trend is reflective of the current economic realities at home in China. And those issues in the Chinese economy are absolutely fundamental to the global south, given the fact that more than 120 countries around the world now count China as their largest trading partner. A lot of those countries are in the global south. I mean, the bottom line is that the Chinese economy is in real trouble right now. There's a very serious problem in the property market. Youth unemployment is so bad that the government announced it would no longer even publish data on it. Chinese provinces, get this, Cobus, we talk about debt crises in the global south. Chinese provinces now are in debt to the tune of $8 trillion. I mean, that is a massive amount of money. And it explains in part why the Chinese are never going to give Zambia debt relief. And we heard a lot of this at the UN General Assembly, that they're calling for debt forgiveness and debt cancellation. China is never going to do that because it's not going to forgive its provincial debt. So why would it then turn around and forgive Zambia's debts, which would be political suicide? People would be furious to say, wait a minute, you're cutting some slack for the Kenyans and the Zambians, but you're not cutting some slack for Zhejiang and Guangdong? Absolutely not. That won't happen. The biggest problem, though, Kobus, is that there aren't any easy fixes. And this is something that the Chinese did in the past when they ran into economic problems. This happened in 1997, 1998 during that fiscal crisis. It also happened in 2008 and 2009 during the U.S.-led property crisis. What they did is they turned on the spigots and just started building infrastructure, massive amounts of infrastructure across China. And today... China has the most incredible high-speed rail network. It has highways that crisscross the country. It's got beautiful subways, amazing ports. The problem is it's got too much great infrastructure now. Too much infrastructure in the sense way too much capacity for what they actually need. They can't actually just keep building infrastructure. This was interestingly the same problem Japan ran into as well when it ran into its economic malaise and also traditionally used infrastructure building as a way to get out. It doesn't work anymore. And so there's really not a lot they can do to fix the property issue in the short term either, given that a lot of buyers or potential buyers are just nervous about their jobs right now in the economy. So they're holding off on these big purchases. And that anxiety that a lot of people are feeling in China is also contributing to worries that China may be entering a deflationary cycle. And Deflation is not a problem that we've been talking about a lot in the global south, only because inflation is the bigger challenge. So it's hard to imagine that people think that lowering prices and declining prices are actually a problem. But in places like China and Japan, who have been struggling this for a long time, when those prices keep going down, corporate profits also keep going down. That leads to higher unemployment, and thus we have a slowing economy. So again, both sides of this, deflation and inflation, are just as toxic. So we thought it would be useful to do a couple of shows to address what's going on in the Chinese economy in order to help alleviate and close some of that knowledge gap that seems to be quite predominant in many developing countries about 
what's going on in the Chinese economy. So we've lined up a number of great guests coming up over the next few weeks. I'm really excited. We've got Michael Pettis, who many of you know, who's one of the top China economists in the world. And we're also going to speak today with Lizzie Lee, who's an economist and a journalist with the New York-based Chinese language media outlet Wall Street TV. She also hosts The Signal with Lizzie Lee over at our friends The China Project, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, she's got a PhD in economics from MIT, and as they say in Boston, she's wicked smart about these things, and just, I mean, she just knows so much about the Chinese economy, so we thought she would be a great person for us to start our discussion about the Chinese economy and the link to the Global South. Let's pick up our conversation with Lizzie Lee. Lizzie Lee, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Great to be here. Lizzie, we wanted to do this show because there's a lot of confusion from people around the world who don't necessarily follow what's going on in the Chinese economy as closely as you do, and certainly as closely as a lot of people here in Asia do. So in places like Africa, the Middle East, the Americas, there's a lot of sensibility that the China today is the same as the China 10 or 15 years ago. We know from the headlines, though, that that's not the case. The Chinese economy seems to be going through a very difficult period. High unemployment, high youth unemployment in particular, property crisis, exports are down, investment is down. And it seems to me, again, I'm not an expert here, that the tools that the Chinese used in previous economic downturns may not be quite so effective this time. That being said, and this is where I'd like to get your take just to start off our conversation. I've been around long enough to remember the 1997 financial crisis. And back then they said China has this huge non-performing loan problem on its banking balance sheet. If China's banks are going to collapse and implode and bring the whole economy down. In 2008, I remember they said the financial crisis, you know, the West and everybody else was suffering. China's got a non-convertible currency. China's going to, you know, go crashing down in a ball of flames. So we've seen this before, this rhetoric coming out from outside of China, and the Chinese have done very well at managing those shocks. Help us understand what's going on today, and do the Chinese have the same tools in their toolkit to be able to resolve the problems that are afflicting the economy? That's a great question, and that's sort of the million-dollar question, I would say. As you correctly pointed out, this is not the first time that China has gone through an economic downturn. People can argue that whether this is the most serious one or, or sort of on par with China's downturn in 2008 or 2015. What's really different this time, I think, is... On the policy side, there have been a lot of mixed messages about what the government will do, can do, is thinking about doing, and that has created a lot of uncertainty for investors and entrepreneurs. So, you know, that murkiness really is quite different this time. I mean, we can start with priorities, right? You have China's government-censored Economists practically yelling, you know, the house is on fire. The government really need to, you know, act now and support the economy forcefully. But if you look at the Politburo meeting, which uh, Xi Jinping chaired over uh, last month, you know, the top list items really have nothing to do with the current state of the economy. He was talking about this new fancy Xiong'an new era close to Beijing hardly giving any spotlight to the current slowdown everyone else is so concerned about. I mean, what gives, right? So that's confusing. And there's also this really murky vibe around Xi Jinping's stance on the private sector. As you know, this whole economic mess, this whole slowdown started in 2021 when China wrote out a series of regulatory crackdowns on DD, on Ant Group, etc., etc. And, you know, if you look at people like Premier Li Qiang, he seems to be giving plenty of support to the private economy, trying to, you know, imbue more confidence in the entrepreneurs in China who have been, you know, shaken uh, from the past few years of regulatory crackdowns. But last month, when Xi Jinping had a sit down with some party officials, his message was basically, we still need to strengthen ideology and political guidance for private entrepreneurs. 
I mean, what's that supposed to mean? Are the private entrepreneurs still on leash now? So that's a huge caution flag. And when Xi Jinping himself talks about the economy, he's really playing both sides. I mean, on one hand, he seems to be admitting that there are some problems in the economy, but he's also hyping up China's economic recovery rate. So what's the real deal here? And Another, you know, piece of puzzle is stimulus package, right? Instead of rolling out the big guns to jumpstart the economy, so to speak, the official statement still talks about, you know, this overall continuity of policy, using targeted measures, avoiding drastic changes, et cetera, et cetera. And that doesn't sound like an emergency response. So there are a lot of uncertainties, but I think the primary source of murkiness comes from policy. And that's sort of my take on the current situation. So, you know, just take a step back. Can you talk us through some of the main issues that caused the problem to begin with? Like one of the ones that have, you know, drawn a lot of attention is the huge debt bubble in the property sector. And, you know, kind of how did that develop? And, you know, how does that connect to some of the other issues that is, is causing the current slowdown? As you are uh, correctly point out, property market really is a huge piece here. As you know, uh, China went through two decades of spectacular growth, but property market features as a sort of a really substantial piece in that, you know, by some estimate, private sector, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the, the property market and related sectors account for 25% or even 35% of China's past years of GDP growth. And that's a significant chunk of the economy. But uh, as you also know, China has accumulated a huge range of problems through that spectacular growth. We can talk about wasteful investment. We can talk about all those ghost cities, money poured into the property sector and didn't really contribute it to, you know, efficient growth, et cetera, et cetera. And local governments have accumulated this huge pile of debt. And I mean, even I would say since 2008, economists been talking about how China have to get its debt problem in check. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, for China, China has two imperatives, right? Economic growth is still very much a developing country. And also China need to rein in some of the speculative behaviors in the property market, as I just alluded to. So this is really kind of a multi-layered puzzle. How do you keep your economy humming along while also keeping your property market in check? So that's really the tightrope walk that Beijing is trying to do now. You know, in terms of how the problem became so bad, I think the previous administrations since Hu Jintao's year, maybe even earlier than that, were basically just kicking the ball down the lane, right? You know, sort of growth is still the primary goal of the central government. And, you know, when the economy undergoes some sort of a setback, then growth becomes the primary objective that the central government is trying to achieve. So that basically means the debt problem is put on the, the back burner and it's becoming worse and worse. So I wouldn't say Xi Jinping himself created this whole problem, but this problem has become increasingly urgent in the past few years. And I think Xi Jinping finally made the call to buckle down and tackle this problem. But then, you know, COVID hit, uh, China's investor sentiment, China's consumption and, you know, factory activity, you know, went through tremendous setback during three years of COVID lockdown. So that sort of doubled down on, on this dilemma that China had to deal with in the first place. So property is very important in all of this. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's the main part or just a critical part, but I'll let you help us understand that. But I think for our audience, just to see if I understand it, let me walk through it and understand and lay out how this might work. So in the old days, the way that provincial governments generated a lot of revenue in order to fund their own development was that they released land to property developers. These property developers would then build these huge developments, people would buy them, and everybody was happy. The problem came when all of a sudden the government was holding auctions for land and the property developers didn't have enough customers to buy the land, and that whole cash flow started to dry up. The debt then from the provinces starts surging and we are in the situation that we're in today. Is that a fair summary of, I mean, a very simplistic, albeit, but a fair summary of at least where one of the big problems in the property sector lies? Yes. So land sales, this is something that uh, local governments sort of got the a substantial chunk of their revenue from. 
But you know, so that's basically the primary source of their income. So you know, China's local governments not tax revenue though. So in other countries, they will tax on income and they'll tax property. But the Chinese they do tax income because I know when I worked in China, I had some income taxes, but I, there was no property tax as we know it. Right, that's correct. And you know, in fact, there are some chatters among Chinese economists on whether you know this will be the time for、uh, local government to roll out more mun- municipal bonds, as is the case in you know in in other countries. But that's sort of a long term solution to a short term problem, and it won't be rolled out anytime soon. So this whole problem created by land sale model is still sort of you know the the, the source of the problem that、uh, you know sort of give rise to the current ills. And- The pro-、uh, property sector in China. So, in addition to the property and related debt problem, there's also the increasing trend that foreign companies are pulling out of the Chinese manufacturing sector, partly due to increasing geopolitical pressure coming from countries like the U.S. So, you know, there's been a lot of kind of very kind of like big claims being made in the Western press, particularly about like, okay, the Chinese manufacturing sector is declining and it's being replaced by Vietnam or by India, etc., etc. So, how serious is this issue or this trend? For the Chinese economy as a whole, right. So I think you know, you know, this is China plus one. You know, moving Chinese, you know, investment to India to other Southeast Asian countries, are, I guess, it's wise investment strategy in theory, but in practice, it will probably take decades to roll out. And the evidence of moving supply chains,、uh, moving money out of China, is still. Very weak and、uh, investor sentiment driven, not driven by any fundamentals. And you know, if we look at sort of the current state of the economy, there are you know several factors that we can focus on. A few. Key metrics, as we say, we can look at factory activity. We can look at consumer sentiment. We can look at property market, as we just talk about. We can look at investment. And if we break it down, we actually saw signs of recovery in factory activity and consumption. People can argue that, oh, you know, the signs of rebounding in consumption is largely due to people loosening their purse strings during summer vacation, etc., etc. So there's some debate there. But in general, I think on the Factory activity side and on the consumer sentiment side, things are not as dire as some people might think. The real beast here really is sentiment. This whole you know loss of confidence, as some some call it, and that's driven by both real and psychological factors. And I think people talk about. Geopolitical headwinds. People talk about, you know, the tension between the United States and China. People talk about Beijing's increasingly some hawkish stance on private capital, foreign capital, and investment, etc., etc. But it's really hard to gauge what the current sentiment is like. And you know, property market, of course, is still in a slump, so to speak. And there's no significant signs of recovery there. So I think. Sentiment itself is, you know, paradoxically more real than the, the real data we can see in the economy at this point. If that's the case, and I hear the same thing from people here in Vietnam who say that Vietnam, for example, or India cannot replace China. They don't have the scale. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the supply chains. You know, in China, you can go to one town, and that town only makes a certain product. And all of the suppliers for that product are all in that town, and there's an economy of scale that really no one else has. That being said, Mexico replaced China this year as being the largest exporter into the United States. Every day we see more announcements from HP, from Foxconn, from Apple, from any number of companies that are diversifying out of China and moving part of their supply chains to other countries like here in Vietnam and India. What's interesting is that the Chinese themselves feel, or at least they seem, incredibly insecure about this whole de-risking or decoupling strategy. You hear it in official statements that they're really critical of the United States for wanting to decouple from China. If China is so secure in its large-scale manufacturing and its factory output is so large, and it won't be replaced for years and decades, why is it then that you think, and that your reading of the Chinese press and all of this, and Chinese statements on this, why are they insecure about it? 
So I think this distinction between short term and long term, right? So in the short term, the Chinese、uh, manufacturing juggernaut is hard to be replaced. People talk about China having not just one factory that's really powerful. China has a whole ecosystem of manufacturing capability that is practically not replicable anywhere else in the world. Even if when we see supply chains moving to Mexico, to Vietnam, to other Southeast Asian countries, if You drill down to the data. The parts that have moved are usually the preliminary sections of the manufacturing value chain. So, in the short term, this is not likely to be an issue. But in the long term, and by long term, let's just call it、uh, two decades or three decades. Yes, significant chunks of the supply chain, the value chain, can be moved to other neighboring countries, and those countries. Who are currently growing fast can take advantage of this momentum and upgrade their position in the global value chain. So, in the long term, this will be a problem for China. But I think in the short term, there's not much ground for worrying. So, whether you are worried, whether you think this is a real issue, very much depends on the time window you are looking at. But do you get a sense that the Chinese, in their official statements on this, are as insecure as they sound? So honestly, it really depends on who you ask. If you ask private entrepreneurs, I think many of them are very concerned about the current geopolitical tensions between China and the world. But if you ask supply chain experts, people sort of、um, know the nitty and gritty of how things are actually going on in those factories, especially what we call front shop workers. They kind of understand the difference in capability between China and those countries, and they're not that concerned at this point. But they also admit that, you know, if this trend continues, it could be a problem for China. One of the other concerns that people have about the Chinese economy is the quality of the data. So recently, the Chinese said they would stop reporting on youth unemployment. They're just not going to talk about it anymore. And a lot of economists were disappointed in that because it was yet another window into the Chinese economy that's being closed. You're an economist. You've studied this for quite some time. When you look at the Chinese economy and the quality of the data, how much confidence do you have that you're really getting the whole picture? And the truth, right? So you know the suspension of the youth unemployment rate, I think, is a very poorly calculated move that sort of fits the autocrats' playbook of hiding unflattering statistics. I mean, if the data is not good, you can still see how bad it is. But if it's not existing, then you have to make the worst possible assumption of what's really going on in China. I think you know economic distress facing China's youth employment is real, but how bad that is? Is it really as bad as? It seems so that the 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 statistics bureau had to bury that data. I honestly don't know. But if you ask about the quality of Chinese economic data, I should say that it has always been problematic. The problems become worse when the state of Chinese economy is poor. So you know, in good years, the data is kind of on par with external estimates.、Uh, when things turn. Worse than the data sort of、uh, deviates from sort of third-party estimates of what、uh, you know economists perceive to be the accurate portrayal of the state of the economy. So that points to data manipulation. But on the other hand, I would say over the past few years, before the COVID situation,、uh, the quality of data actually improved, not because of the sudden reckoning that we should. You know, produce better data, but I think the you know the the technology to collect data basically improved, and that's sort of a global phenomenon, not just limited to China. So you know, as I say, having data is better than no data at all. And even if the data you see is not an accurate portrayal, it's still valuable for other purposes. So historically, one of the interesting, you know, issues to watch, you know, in like throughout Chinese history, has been the relationship between power from the top and then, you know, popular satisfaction. And part of the kind of deal between the Chinese Communist Party and 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 the the population in China has been, a, you know, a, a certain kind of curtailing of certain kinds of rights with the exchange of of very high growth rates and very very quick development. 
So do you get any kind of sense of how the politics is kind of rebalancing in relation to, you know, tougher economic times in China at the moment? Right. So that's a great question. I mean, people talk about this implicit social contract between the Communist Party and the Chinese people. Basically, the Chinese people give up certain political rights in exchange for economic prosperity. And I think that formula had worked well for two decades or three decades. But now, as China faces a structural slowdown, that formula is no longer in balance. And I think that's sort of the fundamental source of the kind of tension you know we see right now between the Chinese people and the Chinese government. But I think another you know issue that I think didn't really get enough media attention is this whole idea of centralization. It has the, the you know the decision making structure of China has never been decentralized, right? It has always been centralized. But here, I mean this time around, I think the drawback of centralization is no longer just a theoretical concern. We are starting to see signs of real world implications on how China is managing its economic slowdown. It's like there's this bottleneck where all decisions have to flow through the very top and by very top that basically means one person and you know past few months it's increasingly clear that that has created a lag in action especially in a rapidly changing economic landscape and i think that's something that could have significant ramifications not just for china but potentially for the implicit social contract that we talked about previously now we've covered a lot of ground in a lot of different areas Again, our purpose today is to help people who are in the global south to better understand what's happening in the Chinese economy so it relates better to them. In this case, many global south countries, in fact, more than than any other country, they sell to China and they have become dependent on China. Many of our raw materials that then go into manufacture finished goods, those are the factory orders then that are very important. What is the most important thing or the most important things that you think policymakers in developing countries should understand about the current changes that are underway in the Chinese economy? I think every economic problem in China fundamentally points to politics. And I think it's important to understand how decisions are made in China, understand how the political system works. Sometimes it can be uber rational. Sometimes it can be completely insane. And I think that's the piece of puzzle, not just you know decision makers in, in developing countries, but decision makers across the world should get a better handle on. And I should admit, we're basically looking through a black box now, and it's really hard to tell what's actually going on. But I think you know, finding credible sources, talking to people on the ground to understand how day-to-day economic decisions are actually made, whether something is decided on an economic basis, whether something is decided not on an economic basis is super important. I think the limited decision-making authorities to experts, to people like sort of experts in in the state council, people working in uh, urban planning sector, housing sector, etc., etc., is quite distinct this time around. And it's really important to recognize that decision-making authorities are delegated differently this time around under Xi Jinping's administration, and that will have implications on how major economic policy changes and, and stimulus efforts are rolled out. So you are in the U.S. at the moment, and U.S. discourse on China feeds into a small but very significant part of African and other global South societies. You know, it feeds into the kind of elites that end up making a lot of either pro-China decisions or kind of being, in the case of my own country, South Africa, being the kind of anti-China, neoliberal kind of side of, of that conversation. So I was wondering what you feel the U.S. discourse about the Chinese economic situation at the moment is getting wrong. Like, what should be added to that conversation? So I would just pick one thing, this whole idea of debt trap, right? I think it's very much a debunked idea, but even among U.S. policymakers, U.S. Congress, we still see that word being you know, thrown around. You know, I think it comes to how we understand infrastructure investment. China very much sees infrastructure as uh, paving the way for development. But, you know, the United States... And the Western narrative sort of sees infrastructure investment as 
a means to a different end, right? This is, you know, basically seeing China's effort to build infrastructure as China's way to develop soft power by、uh, building stealth debt trap dependencies that、uh, so-called beneficiaries in in the host countries would come to regret. And I think that's sort of what's wrong with the narrative that we、uh, frequently hear in Western. Media, but you know, I think it's it's also important to evaluate China's infrastructure endeavors on a case to case base rate.、Right? Some、uh, projects are of higher qualities; others do have problems like corruption and sort of wrongly designed debt structure that can be perilous to the host countries. So I guess you know, it really depends. I mean, I wouldn't say either narrative is. Better or more correct than the others, but on balance, I think we need to drill down to each and every case and see what's actually going on.、Uh, the reality is, infrastructure is probably always going to be very politically fraught, and there will always be infrastructure projects that will end in debt, bankruptcy, etc., etc. But、uh, I think it's also important to recognize how some of the Chinese infrastructure plan and strategy are. Uh, giving rise to some of the best global economic projects ever conceived, and I don't think the United States or Western countries can follow or have the ability to follow China anytime soon. Kobus, it's like she's been listening to our show for the past ten years. I mean, she's just <laughs> repeating it back to us. We, Lizzie, this is you know your your words are music to our ears. We talk about the debt trap and infrastructure and the whether or not the U.S. and Europe can compete on those fronts. So,、uh, so yes, we feel validated in your comments. So thank, but thank you so much for taking the time to explain、My、what、pleasure. is an incredibly complicated issue, and you helped us really to sort things out. Lizzie Lee is an economics journalist with the New York based China. Chinese language media outlet Wall Street TV, and she's also a host of The Signal with Lizzie Lee at the China Project, which you can find on YouTube. We will put links to the YouTube show in the show notes. Lizzie, if people want to follow you, besides what you're doing at the China Project, can they find you elsewhere on social media? Right. So I do have a Twitter account or X account, which I. Seldom use anymore, and I think I'm trying to stay a little bit away from social media and try to do more offline reading at this point. So wow, I'm currently in that's my, very healthy of you. Very, very healthy of you. So I'm currently in my detox phase, but I will admit that I probably spend way too much time on TikTok for、uh, cat videos and yes, you know. Don't we all? Don't we all? Food <laughs>、well. adventures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, thank you so much for taking some time away from your cat videos on TikTok to join us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to talk to you too. Kobus, Lizzie highlights how incredibly complex this is, and if we take that China is one of the major megatrends of the 21st century, up there with artificial intelligence, climate change, and China, it's even more shameful. Okay, that African governments and Latin American governments are not devoting more resources into people like Lizzie, who have PhDs from MIT. She's got a PhD from MIT, by the way. And this is the kind of person that you would want on your presidential staff and in your foreign ministry, building policy guidance for you. Okay, that's not happening in any meaningful scale. And at some point, okay, at some point. The accountability for building crappy policy and not hiring the right people to understand these mega trends falls right squarely on these global south governments. And we've said this over and over again that it's not because the talent isn't there. You and I both know a lot of African students and global south students who have gotten their masters and their PhDs in Chinese economics, in particular, and have nowhere to go for jobs. And yet, these governments rely on the China market more than any other country in the world, and yet they don't make the investment to understand the details that are happening now, which are so complicated. I mean, my head is spinning after this conversation, and I can only imagine that if you don't know what's going on, and you're in, in Zambia or Ethiopia or, or South Africa, how perplexing it must all be. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, what then becomes incredibly frustrating as well is that when things go badly, you know, like, like for example, around the standard gauge railway, then both on the pro-government and anti-government or left-wing kind of side of the discourse in Africa, then it's like, oh, China, they exploit us all the time, you know. Whereas the reality is that you get the China that your government deserves, you know, like the China that your government can locate and, and mobilize. You know, China can build amazing things at fantastic deals and they can build horrible things super expensively. And which one you get is largely dependent on the kind of deal that your own government made. But what we also know is that China is a very convenient scapegoat, both for African governments and for Western governments, to, to blame for anything that goes wrong. And to a certain extent, because some Chinese government officials particularly tend to sometimes be so constrained or so bad at public communication, it makes it easy to blame them, you know, kind of because they don't necessarily always have the tools to come back with the rebuttal of that charge. So it's, it, it's, a, little, it's a little frustrating in all directions. But it doesn't take away the responsibility that these governments have to invest in knowledge-based policymaking rather than the traditional patronage and relationship-based policymaking that is still very much in practice today. And I think what you're going to see is you're going to start seeing a real segregation of the countries that get the megatrends, that understand how to formulate effective climate policies, tech policies around AI, privacy, security, and China. And then you're going to see the countries that don't. And the countries that don't are going to be roadkill, okay? The countries that have very good policies and understandings of China with knowledge-based policymaking are going to do incredibly well, I think. I mean, really, really well. We're going to see them come away with better deals. They're going to reorient their economies to position themselves so they're selling what the Chinese want. And they're not going to come down with these presumptions like William Ruto did a couple months ago and saying that China is going to fund our railway extension when that's just the stupidest thing you've ever heard. I tend to agree. It's also that the thing is, you know, kind of in, in particular key areas, particularly green energy, and particularly also digitalization, China isn't going away. China's just going to, particularly in the global south, China's just going to get stronger and stronger. I mean, China might recede in other fields like railway building, for example, but in terms of like solar energy, China is in lots of ways the only game in town. You know, so it's not only really important for these governments to have a, a strong China strategy in order to get the best solutions out of, you know, the, the China that they can mobilize, but it's also to be <laughs> realistic about what their other partners are willing and able to provide. And to be realistic about the nature of Western power, for example, right, kind of which is a combination of, not to say bad things about the West, but it's, it is a combination of governments that love to promise things but can't really deliver on their own, and a private sector who's the most neoliberal situation that you can ever imagine and who's only there to extract value. So, you know, kind of like in that landscape, you're not going to one-on-one replace China with the West because the West can't show up in the same way that China can. And so you had better have a China policy that works because in a lot of ways, China's going to have to be in the mix. Yeah, but let's not go too easy on China here. Remember, this is the country that in the last FOCAC promised $300 billion of exports from Africa. They promised a billion dollars of vaccines to Africa. They make a lot of promises that are empty, too. We need to be really clear on that, you know, really clear on that. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. But in a landscape of empty promises, the way that the Chinese system works, you know, and the, the kind of overlap between what Chinese companies can offer and what African governments want, that overlap is the reason why China isn't going away. There's a lot of like kind of empty promises flying around, but that overlap is a structural overlap that isn't necessarily there on the Western side. You know, on the Western side, like Western companies still have to be convinced that it's possible to even make a profit in Africa. Whereas Chinese companies have just been around longer, they've done a lot more, they offer what African governments are willing to pay for. And that's just a, just, just a world of difference. Again, I come back to, and I've said this over and again, I think people who listen to the show on a regular basis are going to be like, Eric, stop talking about ASEAN and Vietnam. But I come back to that African governments and those in other regions would stand to benefit a lot by looking at the China strategies of, say, someone like Prime Minister Chin here in Vietnam. And a couple of weeks ago, he was just up in China meeting with Premier Li Qiang, 
And they're talking about expanded trade. They're talking about infrastructure and railroad development. And again, the Vietnamese have been so effective at playing both the West, specifically the U.S., and the Chinese off each other in order to maximize their position. I don't actually know if the Vietnamese are doing a lot of knowledge-based policymaking around China, or it's just by virtue of the fact that they are tied to the Chinese by history and geography, and they just know the Chinese through instinct. Whatever it is, they're very, very effective at playing the China game. And again, I come back to this knowledge-based policymaking that people in Nairobi and Cairo and elsewhere should be studying not only the Chinese economy, but then again, what are other countries that are effectively managing ties with China doing? And that's not happening either. And, you know, okay, they can have 55 excuses as to why it's not happening. We don't have the people, we don't understand it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The end of the day, as you've pointed out, and I think you're absolutely right, if you don't get this thing right, you're going to get crushed. The Chinese are going to make deals with certain countries and ignore others. Remember when Felix Chesikedi, the president of the DRC, went to Beijing and came back totally empty-handed? 100% empty-handed. And yet the economy minister from Argentina went to Beijing and came back with like 12 or $13 billion in deals and infrastructure. That's what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks like. The most fundamental issue is whether leaders actually care whether their countries develop or not. Ah, That okay. is the issue. That is a very, very big issue. And unfortunately, like my own country, South Africa, you frequently get like, South African policymakers listening, you know, be mad. But you, what you, what, looking from the outside, what you frequently get in South Africa is a glimpse of a government that doesn't give a damn about whether the country develops or not. And you see that up and down Africa, of like governments who don't seem to care whether the country develops or not. And that is the main difference between Southeast Asia and Africa, I think, is, is, that, is that in some way, the political survival in Southeast Asia, even in countries where democracy is highly imperfect, seems to be connected in some kind of way with a deal with the population around development. And in Africa, mostly it's not. And, you know, so, so there, there lies the rub, I think. That is the quiet part out loud that you're saying. I mean, that is it. It's the part that a lot of people don't want to talk about, is that dictators like Paul Bia in Cameroon don't want to necessarily help their own people. Yeah, they don't care. They don't care. And we saw this with Ali Bongo in Gabon, who imported snow for his kid's birthday. I mean, you know, Ali Bongo, you know, ran a country of 2.4 million people with massive oil and timber reserves, and yet it's one of the poorest countries in the world. How the F is that possible? But you know, it's also the funny thing is that that goes both ways, because there was recently this amazing viral video where soon after the coup, Ali Bongo made this appeal, it was this, this um, recorded message. Remember, to where make it was noise, like, he wanted yeah, people calling, to make noise. Calling on noise. the population, make noise, make noise, to, you know. And then there was this viral video of these two teenagers kind of sitting around and then the kind of Ali, Ali Bongo's face appears, you know, kind of little, little kind of dot between them like with that. And then that makes some noise, kind of little clip is then sampled and turned into a sample on dance music and the two just dance around it, you know? It was just like, yeah, you know what? Like, you don't care about us, we don't care about you. Yeah, I mean, so again, it comes down to a governance question. So hopefully African governments and other governments in the global south will start to take this seriously start to listen to what people like Lizzie are saying to understand these trends at a much deeper level, start to transition more towards knowledge-based policymaking and knowledge-based foreign policy strategy rather than patronage and relationship-based, which again is incredibly common today. And China's too complicated right now to get away with that. You could have done that 15, 20 years ago, easily, but not today. And the same with tech. You can get away with that 15, 20 years ago. You can't get away with it today. And so whether it's going to happen, I don't know. You seem kind of pessimistic. I hope it will. I think it's going to happen in fits and spurts in some countries more than others. But I hope that specifically Africa kind of takes to it more. That's my long-term ambition. I'm not sure if it's going to end up happening. I mean, we have not seen a lot of engagement from African stakeholders recently. We used to get a lot more in the past. And I, I don't know if that's us or it's them. It might be both, that they're not interested in us and so they don't talk to us as much anymore. But 
it is interesting to notice that our engagement with African stakeholders has gone down. Yeah, I mean, that that is definitely a thing we're watching. But I think there's also, I think the Africa-China relationship is in a lull at the moment, and it's going to be re-energizing towards FOCAC next year. So, you know, we're already now seeing the emergence of a new set of talking points around Africa. There was this call from China around Africa's joining, like, in some kind of way, being put into the UN Security Council. They're kind of unclear about how. But all of these are interesting kind of like emerging things. I think what we're seeing is a, kind of a reset set of the relationship behind the scenes and we will probably start seeing a, like more kind of emerging signs over the next few months in, in the ramping up to 2024. So FOCAC is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. That's going to be something we start to look at next year. Most likely they have already started the negotiations among the various African delegations with the Chinese government and it'll be interesting again to do a report card too on what worked and what didn't again they Chinese promised 300 billion dollars of exports from Africa to China they're nowhere close to it but they have increased agricultural exports quite a bit so does it matter that they didn't get to 300 or is the effort there is that just some kind of goal that's something we'll discuss also vaccines well do vaccines matter as much anymore now Mm, maybe not you know, so we'll look at what they promised and what they delivered. That's something we're going to start focusing on next year. So let's leave the conversation there. Fascinating discussion about economics. We're going to do a couple more shows on the Chinese economy with different economists so that you really get a better understanding of what's happening domestically in China. And that way, that'll help you better understand if you're listening to this from various Global South countries, what it means for your country and how your country can best position itself for this new era that we're in, where China is definitely entering a new stage of its economic development that is far more austere than it was just a few years ago. So let's leave the conversation there. Copas and I will be back again next week. If you'd like to follow everything that we're doing over at the China Global South Project, please, please, we would love for you to join our growing community of readers around the world who are loving the fact that you're getting a team of people from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East writing a daily intelligence brief on everything that's going on with China and the developing world, the only service of its kind. You can sign up free for 30 days at chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. If you are a student or a teacher, we've got half off discounts. Just send me an email, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you those links. So, Let's leave the conversation there. Copes and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China Global South podcast. Until then, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City for Copes van Staden joining us today from Berlin. Thanks so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com, where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.